A Life in Laughter, Café Conversations with Madeline Smith. In conversation with Bill Lawrence. Episode 4. And in this conversation, Maddie talked about her move into primetime television comedy. Beginning of 1971, the hair, and I always take it from the hair. Some actors take it from the walk. In my case, it's the hair. The hair had settled down into a more natural color and a, and a more pleasant style by this time. In other words, what I'm really trying to say is I had settled into my own skin. I had found out, I think, who I was. I'd sort of reverted to the child that I had been. I'd got over all the, the convent and the shyness and all that. And I'd done enough acting now to dare to play opposite Arthur Lowe. And so I auditioned for a lovely director, and I mean lovely director. I'm not just saying it. I, I, I'm careful when I say somebody is lovely. Not everybody is lovely. David Askey. And David Askey was looking for a girl to, I suppose, sweeten up a room full of lads in Doctor at Large, and they are introducing a curmudgeonly old doctor in the shape of Arthur Lowe, and I played his daughter. And Barry Evans comes to work for Arthur Lowe as his locum. And I auditioned for David Askey and was over the moon to get the part for London Weekend Television, as they were called at that time, to play this, this young girl, Arthur's daughter. And it's my favorite job. People always say, who did you enjoy working with most? Arthur. What was it about Arthur Lowe that you really loved? Timing. And the fact that he and I had this innocent, almost father-daughterly rapport, in which case he would say to me, right, that's enough rehearsing, Maddie. And he'd take me by the hand and he'd say, we're going now. I never rehearse past one o'clock. And he didn't. And then he used to whisper to me, you tell him, you tell him. That's enough. If you keep over rehearsing, he said, there'd be nothing left. And he said, you wait. On Sunday night, I think it was Sunday nights, we recorded with a live audience. He said, I'm going to milk those scenes. You wait and watch. And by gum, he did. He was absolutely incredible. His timing was faultless. But when you're rehearsing, you know, in a rehearsal room, you know, as it was, we were on the 20th floor of a, of a dreadful block in Stonebridge Park, Wembley. You know, there's no atmosphere. And, and how are you going to know how it's going to come over? It's really just to get the words and the moves right. He was absolutely correct. If you keep on warting it, you, you, you're just going to run dry and there's nothing left on the night. Arthur was absolutely right. And it went seamlessly every time. So this is a big change for you, Maddie. You've gone from film and modelling where there's no audience and now Absolutely. you've got that audience in front of you. I loved so it. You're, and this changed your career because now you move into all sorts of comedy, don't you? Yes, well, I love, an, I love having an audience there. A lot of actors find it terrifying. They hate it when they go out onto the set on a Sunday night or whenever you record and there's a sea of faces and they've all had a warm-up man and they're all ready to go and, you know, supposedly you are terrified. Well, I just adored it. I like to play two people. I need people, and I always will. And even as a very, very small child, and I mean very small, I was writing plays on pieces of colored paper that my mum would bring back from work and force my poor friends to appear in these dreadful plays that I'd written, and I had a dressing up box and everything, and I even created my own theater. So why I never thought of becoming an actress, I don't know, but I didn't. <laughs> so how did you progress from there? How do, how do you get the breaks again? Because the world's full of you know, people that want these jobs. I know. And you've done Doctor at Large for LWT. I have. So what comes next? The BBC? Well, I had been, before 
be actually before getting the part in Doctor at Large, I had been to audition for for Huey Green, Double Manny, and so on. Yeah. Do you not know it? I know. I know. Double Manny, yeah. it's your lucky day. He's the father of. Oh! Oh! Ow! Ow! Shh. <laughs> Secrets. <laughs> And guess what? I knew Jess Yates very well, and I saw his very white organ. We'll leave that one there, shall we? So, so you got a job with the BBC? So, anyway, I went to audition for Huey Green to be, I think, a hostess or something. He was then in cahoots business-wise with David Frost. They had a company called Paradine Productions. And he obviously thought, hmm, interesting, D uh, David and I are looking for a comedy turn for the two Ronnies. They were about to grasp the nettle with Ronnie Corbett and Ronnie Barker and create a whole series with them, fresh from the Frost Report. So I was completely taken aback when suddenly I'm mounting the many stairs at the BBC. This is all before Doctor at Large. Uh, and. Um, absolutely befuddled by sunshine in my face. I remember this very well. And I'm sitting opposite Ronnie Barker, whom I already worshipped because there was a series on at that time called Hark at Barker with my friend Moira Foote playing the, the waitress. Brilliant stuff. So there I am with Ronnie Barker, and he's pushing a script under my nose. I don't know what it is I'm reading, but I read it, went home, and forgot about it. So I was one day rehearsing Doctor at Large in Stonebridge Park, and the phone rang, and it's the agent, and she said, you have a part in a new series called The Two Ronnies, and you are going to star in a spoof classic serial, which will be spread out over eight episodes. And that's how I got that part. It was actually created round me. What were they like to work with as colleagues? Well, it was filming for me. The studio came later. That March, bitterly cold weather, two weeks filming outside Bath in a great big park attached to a really, really creepy house. And I tell you what, it was fun, but I was frozen nearly to death. And the whole focus was on me. It was all about Henrietta. So, uh, and meeting these vagabonds, but the focus was really on me. The reason being, I was the foil. Jokes don't work without a foil. And those two bounced off each other, but I was kind of piggy in the middle. And you will see if anybody's ever seen the two Ronnies. I'm kind of between the two of them. Ronnie Barker said to me, you've got to have a completely blank face. You really must not show any kind of an expression. So I rehearsed walking up and down in this creepy country house. I spent one entire lunchtime walking up and down, <laughs> totally blank like that. If you could see my face, you know. Because I have a face that flops around all over the place in real life. And so when you see me in the two Ronnies, you will see that I look totally stupid. But that's why the jokes work. And what was it like working with them? Ronnie Corbett was a bag of laughs, a Adorable, brilliant, wonderful. Barker, very serious, virtually directed every episode and really did work me to death. Lovely guy, lovely guy. Wasn't very well. He had some kind of bug while we were filming. So he was quite serious and slightly out of it, except when we were filming. I guess the one I had the, the most chat with was dear Ronnie Corbett. But that isn't to say that Ronnie Barker wasn't absolutely amazing. I used to go with Ronnie Barker and record all my voiceovers for it. Ain't still in my high squeaky voice. And of course, all the costumes were very, very low cut to help the jokes along the way. I adored working with them and again, a live audience. You did um, another one of those serials. Yeah. You did one that was a First World War. I d uh, n well, no, the First World War came into that, I think. Yeah, yeah I, I think uh, First World War... Uh, there was trouble with your dress on that one, I remember. Uh, there was trouble, actually, genuine trouble, uh, twice. <laughs> one was when we were filming in the Theatre Royal in Bath, and I'm playing Lady Godiva, 
or Henrietta is playing Lady Godiva. And I, I'm unclothed except for my long wig. And my wig has to go up in the flies, ha ha. And Ronnie Barker said to me, look, Maddie, that body stocking looks dreadful. When you run off into the wings, it looks awful. It looks like a body stocking. Would you mind very much if you did it naked? Ever obliging, ever willing, Maddie. You can always call on Maddie. I said, of course, that was fine. And so I had, didn't have any togs on. And I dashed into the wings and a towel was waiting for me. Nothing crude. It was fabulous. And the other occasion, we were actually filming in the studio because part of it was done in the studio. Again, on a Sunday night, they knitted the serial in with the laughter, the studio members. And we did a little tiny scene on one occasion. And I'm sitting there between these two rogues. And I felt a rather cold breeze round my, um, well, put it crudely, nipple. And I therefore knew that I was semi-unclothed. And I didn't want to spoil the scene. And it was going swimmingly for Barker and Corbett and rather less swimmingly for me. And anybody that peers very closely at the screen, and particularly if you have a large screen television, you will see what you should not see. So that's, uh, you know, your prime time television now. BBC yeah. prime time. Yeah, was. The, the two Ronnies really was successful, wasn't it? For, Enormously for many, successful. Many the it was the first series and then they went on to make at least a dozen. I'm not yeah. quite sure how many, but loads. So you jumped from that to another prime time comedy. You mean Frankie Howard, I my do. beloved Frankie. I work with Frankie loads and more nudity, uh, <coughs> which wasn't intended. The film Up Pompeii, and he was Lurkio, of course, all set in Rome, wasn't it? Lots of naughtiness. Michael Horden again, Barbara Murray playing my mum, and me as little Erotica. And little Erotica has a milk bath in one of the scenes. And it was terribly funny when somebody let all my milk bath out, and I'm sitting there with no togs on, aren't I? Very funny. And strangely enough, lined up above my head was a series of photographers and those photographs have haunted me to this present day. I have to say with regard to dear Frankie I absolutely loved that man. I did a series of commercials with him for Grandy Cigars, where I actually managed to set light to myself <laughs> instead of his cigar. My rose went up in smoke my, on, my, on my chest. He's very famous for being a bit like me. There. Lots, of, uh, this, uh, uh, lots of pauses, lots yes. of repetition. Yeah, but they're all rehearsed, all Bill. Rehearsed, they're is it really? all rehearsed. None of it is accidental. Yeah. None of it. Total opposite to somebody like Arthur Lowe, who, if anything, dear Arthur, if you want to make any criticism at all of Arthur, and I hope nobody will, didn't really over-rehearse, never absolutely knew his lines, but he knew his timing, and he could invent anyway. But dear Frankie, uh, it's well known that he uh, paced up and down the streets and the beach, I think, because he had a, he had a house uh, near a beach, uh, would pace up and down and people would think that he's a madman because he would he would be reciting his lines over and over again with all the pauses and everything. They were all rehearsed. He suffered terribly from nerves, Frankie. So was that a happy film, sir? Yes! Up Pompeii. Fantastic. Uh, wonderful. Uh, absolutely. I, I, I can't say how, how much I enjoyed it. Uh, it, it literally. And, I, and then I did another one with him called Up the Front. Yeah, the titles. Um, yes, uh, and we had a, um, the wonderful Jonathan Cecil was in it, playing my love interest, and that one was about the First World War. Yeah. Wonderful. Can I think, if anything, I enjoyed that one slightly more because I had a bit more to do in it, I think. Was it around this time that uh, Elstree, was it Elstree called, or Pinewood, one of the big studios, and say, we've got a part in a carry-on film for you? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, and, and, and I did have my little half day in Carry On Matron. Wonderful little part, as uh, Mrs. Pullet was my name, and I had problems with my baby. But for anybody that hasn't seen the film, I'm not going to spoil the joke. Just say that it's one of the happiest half days of my life, and to my great regret, I was offered more, and because I was doing a really half-baked 
tour at the time, I was unable to do it. But so, so he was lovely. He was absolutely lovely, the producer. So nice. Everyone is familiar with the Carry On film team. Yes, indeed. And you work with Kenneth Williams? Nope, I, I have worked with Kenneth Williams, but this was with Barbara Windsor and Hattie Jakes and the wonderful Joan Sims in the bed next to me. Ah, I'll tell you something. It was partly a joke with a sausage. And if you watch it, you will see Joan Sims and a sausage. And I'll leave it there. Right. Joan Sims, Barbara Windsor and Hattie Jakes. Right. Joan Sims, I had worked with previously. I have to tell you that her little bit, because it was in another bed, was actually filmed at a different time. So I didn't see her on that occasion. But I did do a teleplay with her and Richard Briers. And what a joy that was. It was a fado farce. And I just remember Joan Sims and Richard Briers having a discussion about clothes and how much Joan was longing to throw off her costume. She hated wearing clothes. And Richard saying, whatever I wear, it doesn't matter. By nightfall, it looks like I got it from a jumble sale. And it's absolutely true. He had this wonderful crumpled air, did Richard. And that, of course, enhanced his comedy and his comedy timing. And one loved him so much. Barbara loved Windsor, Richard. Barbara Windsor, what was she like? Well, chaps and chapesses and everybody, I can't honestly remember either dear Barbara or Hattie because when you make a carry-on film, it is literally bang, bang, thank you, ma'am. And so I'm in bed, got the baby, the joke, camera's on me, they say their line, and then off they go somewhere else. They only appeared just to do the scene with me. Nothing in a carry-on is rehearsed. It's literally, <laughs> okay, Maddie, there we go. Oh, right. Oh, the baby, the line. And then they, oh, oh, whoa, oh, oh, no, no, that, oh, eh, and they've gone. So we can't leave that hanging in the air no. with Kenneth Williams. No. Um, uh, difficult. Um, um, I did a panel show with him, panel game thing with him. I was wearing, as I am now actually, a cream coloured dress. And in those days, of course, cream, white, dots, flashes didn't go on the telly. And I was silly. I had turned up with a cream dress. And, um, and he came up to me and he just said, you stupid woman, you unprofessional woman. And blah, 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 blah. And he went off like a firecracker. A short time later, he came up to me and apologized profusely for being so vile. So that's my, my one and only memory of the brilliant Kenneth Williams. <laughs> was episode four of A Life in Laughter with Madeline Smith.